Welcome to the County Manager's Report. I'm Lloyd Higuera. With me is Douglas County Manager Steve Mokroheisky. And welcome, Steve, and Thanks. Happy New Year. Same to you, Lloyd. Yeah, it's a, it's a new year. Happy to be in 2013. I think it's yeah. going to be a great year. I think it is. 2013, and we've got 24 of these to do. That's right. In 2013. Okay. So All right. We better get well, on We better it. go. Let's go. <laughs> Let's get going. We have a Board of Commissioners meeting. It was the first one of yeah. the, uh, the year on January 7th in Minden. And uh, as per usual at the first meeting of the year, a new chairman and a new vice chairman were elected. Right. Yeah, and, and every, uh, as you said, the first, uh, and we had it on Monday this year, which is the requirement by state law to do that. And, and uh, each year the, in January, the first meeting in the Valley, the board elects um, their chair and vice chair for the next year, and they typically serve a one-year term. Um, and so uh, Commissioner uh, Greg Lynn was uh, elected by the board to serve as the chairman for the next year, and Commissioner Doug Johnson was elected to serve as the vice chair for the next year. So congratulations to both Commissioner Lynn and Commissioner Johnson. Um, or I'm sorry, maybe is... Uh, <laughs> condolences. Uh, condolences, yeah. Uh, no, seriously, it, it, it's a very important role for the board to have uh, a chair and vice chair, and um, uh, I know Commissioner Lynn and Johnson will do a great job. And, you know, the role of the chair is really to run the board meetings, to help set the agenda for each meeting, and then to run the board meeting, make sure that the business of the board and the county is done as efficiently and effectively as possible. Um, and then to serve in some ceremonial capacities, uh, at different events in the community. Um, the chair or vice chair will oftentimes speak on behalf of the board um, in front of different groups and at different events. And so that's really the role of, of the chair and vice chair. And uh, we look forward to working with Commissioner Lyndon Johnson in the next year, as well as the other commissioners. Great. Okay. Well, then commissioners went on to uh, hear a report on the New Year's Eve celebration up at Lake Tahoe by the Douglas County Sheriff's Office. And it seems like that event is kind of mellowing out a bit over the years. It's yeah. not as big as it was. Right. You know, knock on wood. Um, it, it, you're right. The, the event this, last, this year uh, and last year uh, and last few years have, have been uh, pretty tame. Um, this year, you know, there were, I believe, four arrests and one citation at the lake. I believe there was one arrest in the Carson Valley. Um, so that's, that's not bad, you know, uh, compared to prior years. No major incidents. Uh, Highway 50 was cleared of all pedestrians by 1220 a.m. on January 1st. By 1 a.m., Highway 50 was open to traffic, and so that's pretty good. Um, Very good. And, you know, public safety, the public safety folks, Douglas County Sheriff's Office, um, in conjunction with the Tahoe Douglas Fire Department, 911, East Fork Fire Department, South Lake Tahoe Police, El Dorado Sheriff's Department, um, State of Nevada Highway Patrol and NDOT, Caltrans, and California Highway Patrol, they all do a great job coordinating on, on these events, and, and I think they've got it really down to uh, pretty good science. Um, the, the other piece, you know, frankly, that the sheriff will talk about is, is that threat that always looms out there that you get concerned about, a terrorist threat or some other, um, you know, major incident that could happen when you have a large gathering of people. So the public safety agencies, both in Nevada and California, work really closely because you have such, you know, tens of thousands of people gathered in a small place and um, we want to make sure that we're safe and we keep those people safe and um, so they do a great job of maintaining order law and order um, among those activities letting people have fun and enjoy the new year um, and also managing and preparing for any major event that could possibly happen the other thing you know that's happened in, in the city of South Lake Tahoe the last two years they've done the snow globe event right um, in the city of South Lake Tahoe on the California side and, it, you know, it's brought in, it's, uh, uh, some people have argued it's been a really positive thing for the business community because it's, it's more people in Tahoe over the holiday and brings activity and people spending money. Brings a lot of young people in and some activities that, um, you know, aren't always positive. We had a really tragic event this year where there was a young 19-year-old girl um, uh, that wandered off from the event and they ended up uh, finding her and she had died. And uh, so that was very sad. It was unfortunate. Certainly some elements of personal responsibility that go along with that. But the, the thing that, you know, our Douglas County Sheriff worries about is the, um, when you have two major events like that happening in different locations, that public safety law enforcement uh, resources are stretched. 
um, uh, you know, on New Year's Eve. And so we do our best to manage through those things. And again, just a credit to the public safety agencies for um, no major incidents this year. Yeah. It is kind of a well-oiled machine now. That's been going on for quite a few years. Yeah. And they've really learned a lot in how to manage and handle the crowds. Yeah. Because I can remember they took kind of a hard line at first of, uh, you know, knock that off kind of a thing. Right. And then, then they got more working with the crowd. And it yeah. seemed like that, that seemed to work better. Right. And I think they're more concerned. You know, you get some uh, drunkenly disordered kind of thing and, and uh, underage drinking and some domestic type issues. There have not recently been major incidents and you know as much as you may want to climb up the light pole on new year's eve right. to lake lloyd they do a pretty good job greasing it so you can't get up there so <laughs> there you go uh. <laughs> okay well new year's eve uh sounded you know pretty reasonable at uh, yeah, lake tahoe it was orderly. they did a great job well commissioners heard a presentation this was exciting uh, from connect nevada this is on Douglas County becoming a certified connected community and an award came with it too. That's right, and Douglas County is the, is the first county in the state of Nevada and the second community in the nation to be provided this award. And, and what it really does is this Connect Nevada effort um, works on assessing the local broadband landscape, you know, our connectivity, identifying gaps, establishing goals and objectives to increase broadband access for the public. And um, so I'll give you, you know, just some, some highlights of what we found from the work that, that we've done in our community. And this is stakeholders from um, Douglas County officials, staff officials, as well as representatives in the community and, and state officials compiling this information. And then, again, identifying where the gaps are and, and creating some actions to, um, to close those gaps. We have 16 broadband providers um, currently that are providing service in Douglas County. Nine, over 96% of the households in Douglas County have three megabyte per second um, uh, access to broadband. More than 75% of Douglas County homes have access to 10 megabyte service. 92.5% uh, of Douglas County households have access to more than one provider. Um, and in Douglas County, almost 100% of the households have access to mobile broadband, 99.98%. So pretty good for you know a relatively rural community and some pockets. That we, of, of areas that we know are issues, particularly in the Topaz Lake um, area, we have pretty good coverage and access to broadband for the public. But it's a great plan. Again, Douglas County is a leader in the state of Nevada and in the country in this area. Um, I believe it was another community in Michigan that was the first to be certified as a connected community. Douglas County is the second. And uh, so we'll work on addressing the gaps that were identified there. Well, we have pretty good penetration of uh, broadband, but mine wasn't working this morning. Is that right? You have to bring <laughs> so, the one exact. You're like the uh, uh, the point two percent. Bring it down, yeah. 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 Now, so this broadband connection is uh, is a fiber optic connection, isn't it? I mean, it's right. a it's a serious connection. Yes. And it runs right through Carson Valley, and it was a, a, a kind of a merger of uh, fortunate things happening that uh, that got it to come this way. Yep. And. Why don't you explain Well, there are a number that. of projects then. This Connect Nevada was an effort to really assess the broadband capability landscape in Douglas County. How, you know, what is our access here and then what are, what, where do we not have access and how do we address that? So there are a number of projects that are ongoing. This, what's called the Digital 395 project by, that's being implemented by a company called Praxis. And it's intended to connect, go uh, pro provide broadband access from Barstow, California, all the way to through Carson City and ultimately to Reno, and along the 395 corridor, and so that project is going on. It's it's federal stimulus money. It's over 100 million dollars in federal stimulus money that's doing that, and then providers can connect to that infrastructure along the 395 corridor and provide low cost, high speed, low cost broadband access to consumers. Um, and, and, uh, and public agencies. So that's a great one. The other one that's out there is the um, uh, Nevada Hospitals Association um, had received a grant award to connect the various hospitals in the state of Nevada with broadband connectivity. Um, so there are a number of these things. We, we Douglas County, received a, a grant from the state to connect some of our facilities. So there, there's a lot of public dollars that are being invested in connecting uh, various facilities and allowing really, you know, low cost, high speed access for, uh, for the public. So, you know, we don't have a lot of gaps. We have some, but we're working with the various entities to make sure that we close those and uh, continue to make progress there. How soon will uh, consumers be able to tap into that uh, 
connection there? You know, the, the project is, is ongoing and, and it's, it's probably going to be in the course of the, the next year to 18, you know, 12 to 18 months. Mm -hmm. um, so relatively soon, I would say. Okay, very good. Well, commissioners at their meeting also approved an ordinance. This was uh, changing the Gardnerville town boundary to include 21 acres of new property. And that property is, uh, of course, the location of the new community mm -hmm. senior center. Right. This was so. Yeah, this was annexing, you know, 21 acres, um, uh, really where Herbig Park is, where, as you said, where the new community and senior center will go, into the town of Gardnerville for the purpose of uh, allowing the Gardnerville uh, Town Water Company to provide water service to the new community and senior center. So, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion about what does this mean, and are there additional taxes that will have to be paid, or you know, there are fees and taxes that are associated with that annexation, but it's again for the express purpose of providing water uh, to the facility. So a, sort of a, um, uh, a routine logistical uh, you know, item there. And I will tell you that on, on the community center front, we continue to make great progress and, and look forward to uh, an award of the contract. There are three finalists um, that have submitted proposals for the uh, construction of the facility. And, and we look to uh, make that award, um, or the Board of Commissioners will make that award on February 7th at their board meeting. And uh, we anticipate construction of the facility beginning this spring uh, and opening in early 2015. So just keep moving along there. And this was one of the steps in that process, again, to make sure that we have adequate water service to the facility. Well, that's fantastic. It's, it's great to see that moving along at the speed it is. Super. Uh, commissioners also approved a planned development application from uh, New Beginnings Housing, a 30-unit affordable senior housing complex, something we uh, need here in Douglas County. We do, and you know this was uh, this is a really great project. There's a prior um, plan development and, and development agreement that was in place um, for several years prior to this that never got off the ground, and so um, this project, you know, 30-unit affordable senior housing complex, as you said, on um, on two acres, and there will be a detention pond. Um, there were a few variances that were requested by the developer, and so that's where most of the discussion at the board level took place. Um, and it largely was around, you know, there's a variance to allow a reduction in the number of parking spaces from 68 spaces to 57, a reduction in the number of required storage units from 30 to 23, and a reduction in the number of required RV parking spaces from 4 to 0. So the board asked some questions, you know, why are we making these variances? We have requirements in place. The answer to that is it's affordable senior living, and, and the, um, the owner of the project came forward and said, you know, the majority of the people that will live in these units are single um, seniors who are typically widowed, and they have one car, if that, some don't have, don't even have a vehicle. They darn sure don't have an RV. <laughs> they don't have an RV. They don't have a lot of need for a, a, a significant amount of storage space. So, the variances are being made to accommodate the, you know, reasonable accommodations for the reality of this development project, and our code just can't, simply can't anticipate um, every single project that could come forward. And so, we do, you know, sometimes make variances to the code um, for good reason, and this is an example of that. But we're we're um, looking forward to this project. As you say, it's, it's a welcome. Um, we have a demographic that is a growing, uh, increasing in the age of the population over the next 20 years, we're projecting. And uh, so to have affordable housing options for seniors is, is a positive uh, thing. And, it, and it's a new development. And so the other question was, what does this do to assess values because there are tax uh, implications there? And it, it still will go towards our assessed valuation. So this should result in an increased overall assessed valuation in Douglas County, which should result in overall increased property tax revenue for the county. Okay. And also in conjunction with that, commissioners approved an agreement between uh, Douglas County and New Beginnings Housing to terminate and eliminate an old uh, restrictive covenant that was uh, an earlier agreement with uh, Crest uh, Moore townhouses. Right. And uh, how does that all work into it? That, so that was the prior agreement that was in place from the early part of, of, um, uh, of the millennium there. And uh, now that the board has approved this new beginnings uh, development project, they needed to go and terminate the prior development agreement to allow for this one. That, that one really became void at that point. So it was a technical matter to, um, to terminate uh, that prior agreement that was in place. Okay. All right. So 
little housekeeping there. Right. Uh, commissioners approved a grant uh, deed to convey from Sierra Nevada Southwest portions of Muller Parkway, Grant Avenue, and Carrick Lane. And I guess this is all the area of Walmart. This is in conjunction with the Walmart store. Right. So what was required, the, the owner, Sierra Nevada Southwest Enterprises, w is obligated to dedicate uh, the, uh, by grant deed a portion of Muller Parkway that they constructed, that they were required to construct as part of that commercial development, um, located north of the project uh, site, all of Grant Avenue, which is the access road into Walmart and the other commercial properties there um, and connects to 395, and all of Carrick Lane, which connects to Grant Avenue and Service Drive. This has been a lot of the discussion about access into all the business areas. So the, the owner has, has um, deeded the, uh, those roads to Douglas County, and Douglas County will now maintain and operate uh, those roads. So uh, on Grand Avenue, and this has been a question from, uh, from the public, when is Grand Avenue going to open? It, you know, it is open to traffic, but the signal light has not been turned on. We could not turn on the signal light at 395 and Grand Avenue until this action happened, until the owner deeded um, the roads to Douglas County. The owner would not allow, it was their property, would not allow for the light to be turned on. That now has happened, and, and I can tell you that on uh, Tuesday, January 15th, I believe it's Tuesday, January 15th at 10 a.m. is when uh, the signal light at Grant Avenue okay. will be turned on. So that's a new announcement here <laughs> for you, Lloyd. Breaking news. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so long time in coming, and uh, we're pleased that, that, that Grant Avenue is finally going to open. The improvements to Carrick Lane to allow turning radiuses for all the trucks have been made. Um, so all of that, all of the work on those road improvements has been constructed, and again, Tuesday, January 15th at 10 a.m., um, unless some unforeseen situation happens, uh, the signal light should be turned on uh, by NDOT and will be fully functional there. Well, it must be getting close for Walmart to open then. Are they, yes, they I, have I don't have a date. date. I don't yeah. have a date. They have their, you know, certificate of occupancy, and I think they've been working on stocking the store through the holidays, and you see... Um, what looks like um, employee traffic in and out of there. So I think they're doing training and stocking of the store, and I would anticipate within the next several weeks uh, that the store would be ready to open. Um, and, and, and I do believe, actually, and I don't have the date, I, I thought that I saw the end of January, mm -hmm. something in the range of January 26th. Uh -huh. So I'll, I'll check on that date, and uh, we can provide it to anybody if, if they call our office. But people roaring down 395 south of town will have to contend with a... Uh a signal now. That's right. Yeah. That's right. There will be a signal there, and you know we're still working with the NDOT on the speed of 395, and which is, um, you know, in the 45 to 55 mile per hour range in that area, and we'd like to see that speed limit come down. Yeah. Um, there will be a, a light there, and so, you know, this is the balance between development right. and access to business, which we all want to see, um, but also making sure that we maintain the safety of the traveling public, and we've seen some accidents. Recently, we saw an accident down at 395 right. in Riverview by the 7-Eleven. Fatal accident. Just further, just south of fatal accident, yeah. just south of, of the new Walmart there. And so, um, and there was an issue of, you know, an individual pulling out from the 7-Eleven onto 395, and there's no median that breaks that. So it, it kind of illustrates why in, in, you know, why NDOT and the county, and, and we have these requirements to have certain transportation and traffic safety improvements to make sure that we balance that private development and business activity with maintaining, uh, you know, safe traffic flow. Right. Well, it'll be interesting to see what evolves uh, over the next few months. Uh, commissioners at their meeting also approved a zoning text amendment. This is to allow special occasion homes as an accessory use on owner-occupied homes. Now, we've talked about this before, but... Uh, yeah, we have, yeah, and this, this was a request that came to us from... Um, a family that has an old historic home and, and wished to, uh, w was willing to make some, some improvements to the home and wished to then be able to have a number of events, weddings and, and different uh, events for people. So um, our code simply doesn't allow for the special use of historic homes or other homes, commercial use for these types of events, unless you have a bed and breakfast. And so the, a lot of these homes aren't aren't equipped with a lodging facility, but they still have the, the acreage and the historic amenities and a beautiful location to host an event. And so what we wanted to do, we saw a real opportunity to help 
residents who own old historic properties, the Van Sickle Ranch is an example, mm -hmm. okay, um, on Foothill Road, uh, that's an old historic property that I think we all can agree we want to see that property maintained uh, over, uh, you know, the, for decades and centuries that it's maintained. In order to maintain these old historic properties, you have to make investment. The owner has to make investment, investments to maintain them. So we saw an opportunity to incentivize. There was a demand by some of these residents to be able to host these events. And we saw an opportunity to incentivize improvements into these historic homes to allow them to be restored and maintained um, uh, which is valuable for the entire community. So that's really what this does. It allows, it's a zoning text amendment um, that just allows for the special use of these historic homes if they make certain improvements. So they have to have certain ADA accommodations for people. They s would have to come forward and, and meet the requirements and get approval for a special use permit. Um, so there are other things that the homes would, and the res uh, residents who own the homes would have to do uh, to bring their properties to a level where they could do these things. But the, the one home in Gardnerville that was interested in doing this, it, it, you know, would like to host like seven events and they'll charge for those events and then have them held at their house. They want to make these improvements to their home and we really see it as, as a win-win opportunity for the community. So the board was supportive of that. There was some discussion about do we need to further define historic character and what that means. The intent is not to allow for people to come in and build new homes that have historic character right. that aren't actually historic. <laughs> the intent really was to invest in truly historic properties. So that we're going to leave historic character with that language. It's somewhat um, subjective, but there's a process that people will have to go through that is open to the public, and they're going to have to meet a reasonableness test that um, the property actually is uh, historic. So. Um, this will come back for a second reading and, and we'll talk about it again when it does. Okay. Actually, I, I just remembered um, the first time I heard it was at the Planning Commission. That's okay. I was confused. Yeah, you're everywhere, that. Lloyd. You, know, you, just, you know more than I do. <laughs> no, no, not, not really. Um, commissioners, uh, one last, well, not one last item, but uh, one kind of quick item here. Commissioners approved a development agreement between Douglas County and James J. Butch Perry. This is to authorize modifications to the center median of Muller Parkway. And I think we discussed this before. Uh, what, what kind of modifications? Yeah, this is really just a break in the median on Muller Parkway, just south of the... Um uh, of where the Walmart, the new Walmart is going in. And this is, you know, there's a, uh, a, a gas station, a Maverick gas station at one point had been talked about going in there. So the developer requested that, you know, if, until the traffic counts build up to a point where this would be a safety issue, you know, would it be appropriate to allow for median for access out of the gas station uh, onto Muller Parkway, not onto 395, but just onto Muller Parkway. Otherwise, they'd have to go east down Muller Parkway into the roundabout and come back. So the county has agreed to that, but there will also be a deed restriction um, on that development property uh, that would require the owner to close the median once the traffic volumes get to a level there, that it would create a safety concern. So that's what this is an effort to attempt to be business friendly and accommodate the needs of, of, a, of a developer that we think are reasonable um, to a certain point. And then when we get to a certain point with those traffic volumes, we'll need to close the median. Okay. I don't know if we can do this in five minutes or not. Okay. We did have the uh, community boards. Yeah. Uh, and the com commissioners appointed people to various boards. Uh, maybe we, we can get through these in two or three minutes. Sure. And, I'll do it uh, quick. Uh, well, I can, I can lead you, you in okay. with 911 Surcharge Advisory Committee. We had one applicant, uh, Kenneth Garber, and he was appointed. The two other spots will reopen for others. So if you're interested in the 911 Surcharge, please apply. Advisory Board to Manage Wildlife. We had three applicants, Craig Burnside, Wes Emery, and R. Michael Turnipseed, who were reappointments, and uh, so those, all three of those were reappointed. Okay, Airport Advisory Committee. We had um, six, uh, an, one reappointment and five new appointments and three spots. So the board had a decision to make. They chose Bill Henderson from Carson Valley Inn to serve as the Airport Commercial Community Rep, Lynn Muzzy to serve as the Business Community Rep, and Keith Swanson Dr. Keith Swanson to serve as the community at large representative. Okay. The Carson Water Sub Conservancy District? We had one spot, and Donald uh, Frensdorf uh, submitted an application, and so he was appointed to that spot. Genoa Historic District Commission? There were two spots and four applicants, and Karen Holmes and Becky Tapper were appointed uh, to that, uh, that board. Okay. The Law Library Board? 
The law library has two open spots, and there were two applicants, Scott Doyle and Victoria Barrett, and they were both appointed. Okay. The library board of trustees. And there was one spot and two applicants, and Barb Wilson uh, is currently serves, and she was reappointed. To okay. The Parks board. and Recreation Commission. There are three spots there, two from Tahoe Township, and it was Kelly Gardner and Cherise Smith, and then one from the Carson Valley, and Deborah Lang was appointed there. Regional Transportation Commission. Three spots, two commissioners. Commissioners Lynn and McDermott were appointed. We did not have an applicant for the Gardnerville resident. And we're working with you, Lloyd. Would you like yes. to serve on the RTC? As a matter of fact, I'll be putting my application Great. in this afternoon. Great. Got you on the spot. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And uh, what else do we have? The Senior Services Advisory Committee. There were a couple of resignations from that, but who's on the board now? There are three spots, five applicants, and all the, the three re-applicants, Kevin Servatius, Thomas Ingham, and Robert Schultz were reappointed. Okay. Excellent. We did it. In, Good. In record time. Water I conveyance? Might. You didn't do water yeah. conveyance. Didn't I do water conveyance? No. Or hit it. Okay. There are two spots. Oh, you're right. Ke uh, David Hussman and um, Kurt Dreyer were appointed, so there you go. Okay. Have I got them all now? You got them all. Yeah. <laughs> we couldn't miss water conveyance. <laughs> okay. No. No. Um, I think David we have... David Huseman, I meant to say. David Huseman. Yeah, Huseman. From right. Huseman Ranch. Um, we uh, do have enough time to do a preview of the January 17th meeting. Have you got an agenda yeah, yet? Yeah, you know, it's a light agenda, January 17th at the, um, at the lake. Uh, we'll have a presentation on the Summer 2012 Pathway to Prosperity Chamber Trek. The uh, Tahoe Chamber and South Lake Tahoe Douglas County officials went to Monterey Bay, Livermore, and Sacramento mm -hmm. to look at how those communities have created downtown livable spaces, and so we'll have a really great presentation there. Um, we have a request from Justice Tahoe Justice Court Judge Glasson uh, to um, add funding, $105,000 in funding for two new positions uh, for the Tahoe Justice Court. Um, so a discussion on that one. And then there has been a request to talk about this United Nations uh, Agenda 21, which was passed in 1992, signed by President Bush, and talks about various uh, development uh, guidelines, master planning, zoning guidelines uh, across the world. And so we'll, we'll bring that one and uh, see how it, if at all, it relates to Douglas County's planning efforts. Okay, so that meeting is up at Lake Tahoe, starts at uh, 1.30 on uh, January 17th. Right. Okay. Anything else you want to talk about today, Lloyd? Well, we have a, about a minute left. We, okay. could, we could plug the website one more time. Sure. Because so much information is on there right. for local residents. DouglasCountyNV.gov, and um, a great website. We continue to put, you know, monthly newsletters. We put these videos. Uh, we, you know, you upload them to YouTube, and then we link them on the page. You can watch the latest YouTube videos, a lot of information about the county and updates. You can sign up for emergency alerts and and uh, to get notified uh, on emergencies and other things that go on. So check out douglascountynv.gov and uh, let us know other information that uh, you think would be valuable to provide with the public. Great. Well, Steve, I want to thank you for uh, being here and sharing all that information. And uh, that's what we do here on the County Manager's Report. For Steve Mokro-Heiske, I'm Lloyd Higuera, and we'll see you next time on the County Manager's Report.